Welcome to AP Live Review with Mrs. Julia Lano from Hamilton Southeastern High School in Fishers, Indiana. We are going to review questions for the AP Computer Science Principles exam. Remember, for the AP Computer Science Principles exam, you get an exam reference sheet. You're seeing it here on the screen. You can also access it on the College Board website. You will get this entire packet to help to explain the code that's on the AP exam, which is blocks or text-based pseudocode. May not be the language that you learned in your class. So if you want to reference that now, we will see some code throughout these questions. You are also able to access the questions by accessing a PDF in the top right corner of this um, video or in the description on YouTube. So let's get started. Let's take a look at our first question. Question one, a numeric test score is to be converted to a letter grade of A, B, or C according to the following rules. If the score is greater than 90, it's considered an A. If the score is between 80 and 90 inclusive, it's considered a B. And any other score is considered a C. Which of the following code segments will assign the correct letter grade to grade based on the variable score? If we take a look at number one, we see that it assigns B in the else. This is an if else. That means one or the other of the options will be processed in an if else. So therefore, the grade of C will be wiped out if the grade is not greater than 90. So this is not a good choice. That eliminates two of our answers already. So if we look at uh, the code on two and three, question two, we see if it's greater than 90, we get an A. If it's greater than or equal to 80, we get a B, and otherwise we get a C. That seems to match what I have highlighted in the question there. So we'll say that is one of the answers. And then we'll look at options three. If the score is less than 80, we assign the grade C. If the score is less than or equal to 90, we assign the grade B, and otherwise we assign A. Again, that goes the other direction, but it seems to assign the correct values. And so we're gonna say three is an answer as well. So two and three give us the correct answers. So the answer here is D. Question two, in the following procedure, assume that the parameter X is an integer. So we have X, is, if X is negative in every single one of our answers. So let's think about if X is negative, that means Y would be assigned the value true. So if Y is assigned true, then our if is processed because it says if y. That means if y is true, it will display y. So therefore, I can look at my four options and say, oh, a and b are eliminated because it will display y. So y is true. It displays true if x is negative. And what does it do otherwise? Nothing because there is no else. So therefore, our other part, it displays nothing. That means our answer is c. All right, question number three. A student wrote the code segment to the left, which displays true if the list my list contains any duplicate values and displays false otherwise. The code segment compares pairs of list elements setting contains duplicates to true if any two elements are found to be equal in value. Which of the following best describes the behavior of how pairs of elements are compared? So notice the code here. We have two repeats. We have two variables, J and K. So clearly the code segment iterates through my list. And so I've underlined the parts of the question or the answer choices, which are different. So we are comparing each element to all other, element, other elements in the list. Are we comparing each element to all subsequent elements in the list or to the um, just the element that immediately follows or to the element that immediately proceeds? This K equals J plus one is really important here. So we set J to one to begin with. And then inside the first repeat, we set K to J plus one, which means it's the one after K. And you notice that we are comparing in our if, if my list J is equal to my list K. So we really are concerned about those values J and K. So if, we're, if we set K to J plus one, then we're not dealing with the one immediately preceding it. And so we are looking at the one after it, but we're not just looking at it once, that's in a loop too. So therefore we can eliminate C. And so now, are we comparing it to all the other elements in the list? If we set K to one more than J, then we're just doing all the ones after it because we're not comparing it to the one before. And again, every time through the loop, J changes. So every time we just keep going to the subsequent values. So therefore, our answer is B. On to question four. A homework assignment consists of 10 questions. The assignment is graded using a chart to the left. Let num correct represent the number of correct answers for a particular student. The code segment to the left is intended to display the appropriate grade based on num correct. The code segment does not work as intended in all cases. So for which of the values of num correct does it not 
display the intended grade. And we have to select two answers. So in this case, let's just try them. So we try nine. Nine's greater than seven. Nine's greater than or equal to nine. So it will display check plus. That one seems to be accurate, which means it's not one of our answers because we're looking for one that does not display the intended grade. Moving on to eight, eight is greater than seven. And then we go into the second if, eight is not greater than or equal to nine. So else it will display check minus. That is not what eight is supposed to display. So therefore it is one of our answers. Now seven, seven is not greater than seven. So then it'll go to the else and display check. That is what seven is supposed to display according to the chart. So that is not one of our answers. Again, now six, six is not greater than seven. That means it'll go to that big else, display check. Six is under seven, so it should be check minus. That is not what is intended. So our two answers are B and D. Don't really worry about how to fix code. All we need to do is find the two that don't work as intended. All right, question five. In the following code segment, score and penalty are initially positive integers. The code segment is intended to reduce the value of score by penalty. However, if doing so would cause score to be negative, score should be assigned the value zero. So there's our important pieces of that first sentence. For example, if score is 20 and penalty is five, the code segment should set score to 15. If score is 20 and penalty is 30, score would be set to zero. So let's take a look here at the code segment that does not work as intended. And we are trying to find which of the changes that can be made to make it work as intended. So it looks like our if is correct. If score minus penalty is less than zero, we want to set it to zero. Oh, but that doesn't look quite right. So let's look at our answer choices. So should we change line one to if score is less than zero? Doesn't seem right because score should be positive to begin with. It's if we subtract, is it less than zero? So not A. Change it to score plus penalty. Both B and C talk about adding penalty to the score. Nowhere in our question does it talk about adding the penalty. So I'm going to eliminate choice B and choice C. And then I see choice D. Oh, switch lines three and seven. That seems to be correct because if score minus penalty is less than zero, we want to set score to zero. Otherwise, we want to go ahead and subtract like the choice of the example of 20 minus five. So D is our answer, interchanging lines three and seven. All right, question number six. Consider the following code segment. What is the value of R as a result of executing the code segment? Here's a big chart where we're just assigning values. Remember that arrow means to assign the value of, or you can say get. And so on your during exam, you should write this down on your test booklet or on your scrap paper and trace the values of the variables. So here I have P, Q, R, and S, and those first four lines of code set them to 10, 20, 30, 40. So then I'm gonna go on to where P is assigned the value of Q. So on your paper, that means P gets wiped out and is now assigned, assigned the value of 20. So then we move on to the next line. Q is assigned the value of R. So that means Q gets wiped out and is assigned the value of R, which is 30. Next line, S gets the value of Q. So that means S gets wiped out and assigned the value of Q, which is 30. And our final line, R gets the value of P. So R gets wiped out, is assigned the value of 20, and that is our answer because we want the value of R. So that means our answer is B. So using your scrap paper or your test booklet to write this down is very helpful. Question number seven. The words, three words are stored in the variables word one, word two, and word three. The values of the variables are to be updated as shown in the following table. So you see we have word one, word two, word three. Notice their value before and the value after. So looking at this, word two doesn't change. So I can quickly determine which of the following code segments or eliminate some of the following code segments that need to update the values as shown. So word two doesn't change, therefore it means I don't need to mess with word two. So I can eliminate choices C and D. Now I'm down to A and B. The difference between answers A and B is that second line really the second line. The third line's different too, but it's really the second line that makes the difference. In both of them, the first line assigns the value word to temp. So that means word one has been saved in the temporary variable. So therefore we need to now have word one get the value of word three because we've saved word one. So now we need it to store the value of word three and then we can put the temp into word three and that will swap the two values. Again, a common piece of code that you've probably seen before. 
And so therefore we need to use answer B because that assigns a value from word three into word one. And then the temp is stored in word three. Question eight, consider the following procedures for string manipulation. We have concat and we have prefix. The variable initials is to be assigned a string consisting of the first letter of the string, first name followed by the first letter of the string last name. Which of the following assigns the correct string to initials? So you see there, we've already eliminated one of the choices because we need to take the concat, we need to get the prefixes and assign them to each one. And so we know first letter. So we notice there that prefix pulls off one character. So we don't need two characters of the prefix. So I eliminated choice B. And then also looking here at how concatenate works, I need to do string one followed by string two. Therefore, I can eliminate these because I don't want to concatenate first. I need to do that prefix first. And so after looking at those numbers and realizing that I need to get the prefixes, then connect, that means our answer is going to be A. On to question nine. The following code segment is used to determine whether a customer is eligible for a discount on a movie ticket. The category is new, so I'm just going to go ahead and replace category with that value. And the age is 20. So if that is the case, so I'm just going to write those in. And if that is, what are the values of VAL1 and VAL2 as a result of executing this code segment? So we see first this is true because new equals new, but then it says not, so now that's false. And then on the right, 20 is not greater than 65, so that's false. So I have false or false, which results in the entire segment being false. So next one new or new is true, new equals new is true. And then 20 is not less than 12, so that's false. So true and false results in false. So that means our answer is both of them are false or D. All right, question number 10. A software development company has created an application called File Cleanup. When the application is run on a user device, it searches for all files, including pictures, video, and documents that have not been accessed in the past month and stores them on the company's web server and deletes them from the user device. The application runs once each day and users have the ability to manually retrieve files from the server if they are needed. So which of the following is most likely to be a harmful effect of using file cleanup? So the differences in the question here are frequently used files or infrequently used files. So it's really kind of what we're looking at. So it's these infrequently used files that have been stored. And so you notice we're talking about internet connectivity too. So if there's no internet connectivity, it's those infrequently used files that are important to take a look at. So that means I can eliminate those choices of those frequently used ones and look at the infrequently used ones. And if there is no internet, that's a problem. We could not access them. So that's a harmful effect. I still wanna be able to access them. So that's why the answer there is B. All right, we've come to the end of our questions. If there are anything that you need to review, here are the topics that were covered in this session. Collaboration, program function and purpose, program design and development, identifying correcting errors, beneficial and harmful effects, and computing bias. Again, you can find more about these topics on the AP Daily videos on AP Classroom. We also cover these topics from Big Idea 3. So a lot to do with variables, data, mathematical expressions, strings, Boolean expressions, conditionals, and iteration and developing algorithms. Again, check out the AP Daily videos on these topics on AP Classroom. Thank you for joining me. I will see you next time.